Good morning. Certainly good to be here with you this morning. I, I can't help but think every time we come back to this campus, there is just a flood of memories. I'm sure it's the same way with you. It's amazing, no matter where you are in life, in real life, I guess you could say, uh, outside, whether things are going well or things are going bad, when you come, when I personally step up on this campus, that all goes away. Uh, there is something about the encouragement you get here that is just, it just doesn't compare with any place else. There's a camaraderie here, and uh, I look back on my two years here, and, and you know, you hear people say, I want to come back, I want to do it again. When you're going through the two years, you're wondering, why would you want to go through this pressure again? And then you get out into the real world, and it's like, whoa, now I know why. I love this, this school. I love their stand that they, that they continue to make, and, and uh, I, I owe them immensely. And I know you feel the same way, and I love this subject. This has been a great week, has it not? I love this subject of purity. The Bible has a lot to say about purity. Uh, it reminds, uh, we're reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul, and we've heard this several times this week in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. Flee youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul is saying our heart must be pure. That is, our heart cannot be diluted with the sinful things of this world. I got a very, very quick education as a very young married man. Uh, years ago, I uh, was sent to the store to get a very simple item. Uh, just pick up a thing of cranberry juice. How hard can that be? And so I go in, go to the juice aisle, and there are all the juices. I see the word cranberry. Great. I pick it up. It was the days before self-checkout, so I wait in the line. Uh, finally get home, and I get a Ph.D. level lecture on the difference between cranberry juice and cranberry juice cocktail. Look at the ingredients. There's corn syrup. That's not supposed to be in juice. I grew up on Kool-Aid. Who knew, right? Uh, you, you see grape juice is in there. Apple juice is in there. It's a cocktail. No, we needed 100% juice. What was the problem? It wasn't pure. It was diluted with all of these different ingredients. Our hearts cannot be diluted with the sinful things of this world. Reminds me of the words of Jesus himself. He said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Uh, there is no room in our hearts for anything or anyone else other than Jesus Christ. In other words, our hearts are to be pure, not diluted. One way our hearts can become diluted toward God in impure is through the sin of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. When we think about the term righteousness, we're talking about being right with God. Acting in a right way that is pleasing to Him. When we think about self-righteousness, all of a sudden our focus uh, turns away from God and places it on me. Webster defines self-righteousness as being convinced of one's own righteousness, especially in contrast with the actions and the beliefs of others. So if I'm one who is self-righteousness and all of a sudden I've taken my focus completely off what God requires of me and I have placed it on my own standard of righteousness, what I think is right, what I feel is right. And when I fall prey to that type of sin, all of a sudden the result of that is I don't see any reason to conform to what God says. Because I've already made up my mind based on what I want, what I feel. And that is extremely, extremely dangerous. This is what we find the Apostle Paul writing about in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, we read, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 
For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, in the context, Paul is talking about his Jewish brethren, his Jewish kinsmen, that is. And these are individuals who have refused to accept the evidence that was clearly presented to them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that they have been looking for for centuries. Within these words of this great apostle, we find a recipe, if you will, that implicitly shows how we can prevent ourselves from falling into this trap of self-righteousness. Within this passage, we see a problem stated. We see the cause of the problem. And then we're going to end and conclude by looking at the words of Jesus to find a solution to that problem. The resulting problem of self-righteousness is stated by the Apostle Paul in verse 3 of our text. He says, they have not submitted themselves to God. These are individuals who refuse to put themselves under God's authority because they have their hearts centered not around God, but around themselves. And when this happens, think of what this deprives an individual of. All of those spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1-3, found only in Christ. All of a sudden, I don't have a possibility of forgiveness. All of a sudden, I don't have the, the, the privilege of bowing before God's throne and laying my problems at His feet in prayer. All of a sudden, I have no relationship, no reconciliation with God. All of a sudden, my sin burden is still there and is not relieved and I'm still under the burden of my sins and ultimately, I have no hope. No hope for eternal life with the Father. And yet here, individuals so completely focused upon themselves, they ultimately don't see any need for submission to the Holy Word of God. They're blinded by their own wants, their own desires, because they have placed themselves as authority above God, and the end result will be eternal damnation. So how does this happen? When we look in our text, we see an equation, a recipe, if you will, for this submission. According to Paul, there are two basic ingredients needed for one to submit themselves to God. Zeal and knowledge. Now in this particular case, as noted by the apostle, zeal is present. There are zealous people, but the knowledge aspect is gone. It's absent. Their zeal for God is moving them to want to please God, but they had no knowledge of what God required of them. And so in verse 3 we read, they're going about trying to establish their own righteousness. In other words, they have become their own standard of righteousness. If I'm going to please God, I have to know what He requires of me. And the only way to do that is to diligently become a student of His Word. Think of what the Word of God does for mankind. It is a Word of God that helps to develop a faith within man, Romans 10 and verse 17. It's that Word of God that is described as that two-edged sword that is able to divide asunder the heart of man, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. It teaches man what he must do in order to be born again, in order to find that forgiveness and to become part of the family of God, 1 Peter 1, 23. It helps the child of God when temptations come. As we look at the example of Jesus in Matthew 4, as those temptations came, what did he say? It is what? It is written time and time again. It is the word of God that prevents sin from infecting the heart of man, Psalm 119. Verse 11, is it no wonder then that Peter would write in 2 Peter 1 and verse 5, those Christian graces, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. Peter says we're to add knowledge to our lives. When we look at the original word there that's translated as add, it's a word that means to fully supply. 
I am to have a fully supplied knowledge in my life that comes from the Word of God. Later on, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, same letter, he says to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our knowledge of God will always, should always be increasing in our lives, should be growing in our lives. And there will never be a time in the life of a Christian when the adding of this knowledge is to stop. But when I lack knowledge, that is detrimental. Hosea 4, 6, we know the verse well. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When, without knowledge of God's word, I am completely in the dark in regards to eternity. I don't know what God requires of me. I'm cut off from the word of God. I cut myself off from the inspired teaching of God. I cut myself off from the inspired correction of God. I cut myself off from the inspired instruction of God. And as a result, I am nothing but immature, incomplete, and completely unprepared for the work that God requires of me. That's the problem that Paul is pointing to when he's talking about his Jewish kinsmen. They love God. They had a zeal for God. But they were lacking the knowledge that would have told them what God required of them. How to submit to God on his terms. There's a second aspect to this recipe, if you will. And that is zeal. Now these individuals happen to have zeal. They lack knowledge. But the opposite case can be true as well. I can have knowledge without the zeal. I can't help but think of the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2. The letter to Ephesus starts out, and it seemingly starts out well. Verse 2, I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, how you cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. That sounds great, doesn't it? But then he continues, Nevertheless, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Here's a congregation in Ephesus. They had the knowledge God required. They, they knew what they were supposed to be doing, and they were doing it. They were practicing the right, the right things. And, and the Holy Spirit through John says, you've left your first love. In other words, they're going through the motions, but they don't have the zeal for what they were doing. Something very similar in Laodicea, the very next chapter, chapter 3. Jesus says, you're lukewarm. You've lost your zeal. And in response to this, Jesus tells him, hey, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out. I will vomit thee out of my mouth, verse 16. When zeal is lost, when zeal is no longer the motivator for my obedience, we fall into the danger of trying to earn our salvation. The focus of our obedience is no longer on God. All of a sudden, it's on me. And so I'm doing all the things God has said to do, but not in order to bring Him glory, but in order to earn heaven. We begin to think about, well, you know what? I'm I'm there every time those doors are open. I'm teaching the Bible class. I'm preaching the sermon. I'm singing the song. I'm, I'm taking the communion. I put my check in the basket. I bow my head when they say the prayer. When the gospel meeting times come, I'm there every night. And we begin this checklist religion. Saying the song, check. The cup, the bread, check. The check, check. (laughs) The preaching, check. It's all done like we're going to get to heaven, give God a receipt with our hand out. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Going through the motions is not enough. I have to have the zeal. We become robotic in our obedience. And when we do that, we're robbed of the joy that comes from being a member 
of God's family. I love what Peter says in 2 Peter 2 and verse 3. He says that we as Christians should be ones who have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Do you remember back in school? I, I, I went to school several places being a preacher's not kid but child. <laughs> we moved every few years, but every school seemed to have a very, very similar circumstance when it came to lunchtime. Especially when we got to high school. Get into the lunch line, you have about 25 minutes for, for all of these hun hundreds of children to, to, to go through the line to get your food. You sit down, you have maybe 15 minutes, but you have to get to your locker, which is over here, and then to your next class over here. That takes five minutes, so you have about 10 minutes to wolf your food down. And quite frankly, you eat it so fast you don't even taste it. And with school cafeteria food, that's probably a good thing. But have you ever gone to your favorite restaurant? Maybe it's a steakhouse. You order that big old T-bone. It comes and it's perfectly cooked. Do you want to wolf it down? For the price you pay, you better not. You want to cut it off piece by piece, don't you? Savor it. Peter says we need to stop and remember to savor the grace of God. And we can become so busy in our lives with work, with family. I, I mean, you have younger children. You have to constantly watch them. They get into school. All of a sudden, you're a taxi driver taking them from here to there, going to this game, to that game, to that event. We, we get busy. We're a busy people in a busy culture. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we simply forget all of the things that God has actually done for us. And just like Ephesus, we can come to the realization that, hey, we've lost our first love. And when we get to that point, we need to stop, repent, turn back to God's word and be reminded of all the things that he's provided to those who will submit to him. I love Hebrews 12. That reminder, uh, that image the writer gives of that Christian race and that reminder to stay under the pressure. But as we run the race, notice what he says, verse 2. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. There are going to be times we're running this Christian race, this Christian life. We're going to be weighed down with life. We're going to want to quit. And we point back to those individuals who went through hard times throughout Scripture as well. And, and, and we're reminded they were, they were successful. We can be successful too. But then the writer says, you need to look to Jesus. You need to look to Jesus and that sacrifice that he made for you. The word look there in verse 2 comes from a word that means to look attentively. Many times after services, I'll need to get to somebody, either to ask a question or, or, or to discuss something. And, and usually as, I, as I'm going through and I see them in the back of the room, and so I'm, I might get their attention and say just one minute. And, and so I'm going down the aisle and, and this person comes over here and says, hey, how you doing? You shake hands and I'm still looking to stay right there. Don't go. And, so, and then this person says, hello, you've been there. Finally, you get to them five, ten minutes later and you deal with the business that you're dealing with. That's not the word here. The word here is looking attentively. In other words, I see you in the back of the room, and I see no one else. And so I make a beeline to you. Someone says, hey, how you doing? I don't see them. Someone puts out their hand, I don't see it. I'm focused on you. The Hebrew writer says, looking unto Jesus, you be focused on Jesus, and you let everything and everyone else in the world fade away. And then he says, you consider him. The word consider, ana legizomai, legizomai, logic. You reason, logically reason on a up. I am to look to Jesus. And I am to logic up, reason up to Jesus as the one who made the sacrifice for me. And that, that will stoke the zeal that I am to have for him. Zeal and knowledge. Both essential in our lives. If we're going to be obedient, if we're going to be submissive, if we're going to be successful, 
in the Christian life. Without knowledge, we begin to base our salvation upon what we feel, what we think, instead of what God says. Without zeal, we're robotic in our obedience. We attempt to earn our salvation in a legalistic matter based on what we have done instead of what God has done for us. Let's look at the cause of all of this. The underlying cause of this self-righteousness we can find in verse 3 of our text. Paul says they are ignorant of God's righteousness. The word ignorance is interesting. It's translated from a word that according to Strong's means not to know through a lack of information, but it doesn't stop there. Because there's an implication here that the information has been ignored because of their disinclination. In other words, these individuals that Paul is speaking of has had the information given to them. The evidence has been presented to them, but they have simply refused to acknowledge it. Now think about the people about which Paul was writing. Here are these unbelieving Jews, his kinsmen of the flesh. Think about what they have seen. Most likely, many of them have seen Jesus himself as he performed those miracles. Many of them, no doubt, had heard the words of Jesus as they sit and listen to him teach. They still rejected him. We read of those who would say that they were, they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. They still rejected him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I hear individuals say, oh, I wish I could go back and see all those miracles Jesus did. I understand that. It would be an awesome thing to see that power actually on display right close, right up front and personal. But I think even more so, I would love to go back and hear him teach. I would love to go back and hear him pray. Hear individuals who had most likely the opportunity, they still rejected him. Still rejected him. They saw the evidence, but they refused to comprehend it. So in Matthew 15, 14, Jesus would call them blind leaders of the blind. You go over to Matthew 23 and Jesus calls him blind five different times. He calls him blind. And it's no wonder because here the Messiah is with them, yet they're refusing to comprehend exactly who he is. They were refusing to comprehend what they're seeing. Something is obstructing their mind from putting the evidence together and coming to the correct conclusion about the identity of Jesus. When I was a child growing up, went a lot to the movies and you know today we don't have this problem stadium seating anywhere you sit you don't have to worry about it you can see the screen when I was a child man that makes me sound old when I was a child the floor was flat and so here I am seven years old eight years old I'm wanting to see Indiana Jones fight the Nazis I get my seat I'm excited and here comes, here she comes. It's the 80s. A woman that's five foot two with hair six foot tall. <laughs> Half a bottle of Aquanet. Sits right in front. Can't see the screen. She's blocking the screen. I'm having to turn around, look between the seats. I can't see the screen. Here are individuals. They refused to see who Jesus was, who Jesus is. But it's not because of an external force. It's nothing external that's blocking their view. It's something internal. It was self. They're presented with the evidence of his deity through the miracles, through his teachings. But they refused to comprehend it because self was in the way. As a result, they refused to submit to God's new covenant and rejected all of the spiritual blessings found only in Christ. If we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap. We can allow ourselves to get in the way of our submission to God. We use phrases, and we've heard it when we study with individuals. Oh, well, you know what? I feel 
Or, you know, I think that's what's happening here. Balking at the requirements that God has set forth based on our emotional selves. What we want, what we desire. And we have to remember those words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Well, what's the solution? I believe we can find the solution in the words of Jesus himself. In... Mark 8 and verse 34. Jesus says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. There are three commands here. Three imperatives found in this statement that are essential if I'm going to remove myself from the center of my life. First thing Jesus says, I have to deny myself. The word deny is translated from a word that means to remove away from. And the idea is I take self and I remove myself away from myself. And so I am to take away self from the center of my thinking. And so when it comes to my desires, well, I place them aside. I'm going to concentrate on what God desires from me. And there's going to be times where, you know, I'm going to read in God's Word that I need to be doing something that I don't want to do. It might be outside of my comfort zone. It might be something that's uncomfortable for me, but I have to do it anyway because I put myself aside and I obey anyway. There are people in this world that we may not really care a whole lot about, but we're going to treat them the way God says to treat them because it's not about us. It's about Him. I have to once and for all develop this mindset that I'm going to say no to myself when I find something in God's Word that is different from what I want. And this becomes an all or nothing proposition. And where we trip up with this is when we say, okay, I'm going to give God 95%. But this little bitty dark corner with the cobwebs in it He doesn't really need that. And I'm going to keep that for myself. It's not good enough. I have to have the mindset that says, no to self. And yes to what God wants. And if I don't do that, then all of a sudden I'm making the Bible a big old buffet. And I fall into the trap of the buffet religion that we hear about sometimes, where I take a little bit of this and... I leave that away. You know, you go to a buffet, you grab the mashed potatoes and gravy and the mac and cheese, and you leave the cabbage and and all of the green stuff behind. It's an all or nothing concept. There's a second imperative in this statement. Jesus says that I have to take up my cross daily. On the surface, this sounds very similar to Galatians 2.20 when Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ But if you look at these words more carefully, Jesus is saying, not go crucify yourselves. He's saying, take up your cross. He's not saying, go execute yourself. He's saying, take up your cross. The Roman tradition is where is is that they would force the the condemned to carry the cross beam, the pentabulum, to their to the site of their demise. And Jesus is saying, you take up your cross, you carry it. You lift up your cross beam. In other words, you do what God tells you to do even when it's difficult. Even when it's hard. Even when the burdens of life are so great that you think you're going to collapse under the weight of it all, you continue to bear. You endure. There's a third imperative. And that is follow me. The verb tense there is one that suggests a continuous action. I continue to follow. I don't ever stop. And so I have to develop this mindset that I'm determined to walk with Jesus no matter where the path leads me. If it becomes difficult, I'm still going to follow. If I'm struggling to keep up, I'm still going to follow. And there are going to be times when we feel like giving up. There's going to be times when we wonder, can I even continue along this path? And that's why I have to develop that mindset that I am determined 
to say no to myself. I am determined to do what God requires of me even when it's hard and I am never going to stop walking in His footsteps. If I'm going to have a submissive heart towards God and His Word, I have to have a zeal based upon the knowledge of His Word. A zeal that will motivate me to be obedient to the the commands of God and to submit my will to His. And in order to do that, I have to take self out of the equation. I cannot let myself overshadow the things that God requires of me. I have to place God at the center of my life and remove self. If God is not at the center of my life, I run the risk of basing my salvation on my own zeal, my own feelings. I become my own standard of righteousness and ignore His word. I'm also very much in danger of trying to earn my salvation when I lose my zeal. I'm reminded of Mark chapter 12 where we read of a lawyer who comes to Jesus. You think lawyer, my first thought is Perry Mason. That's not what we're talking about. It's literally a man of the law. A law man. But we're not talking about Wyatt Earp either. We're talking about a scribe. And he comes to Jesus. The scribe was one of those individuals who would like to sit around and debate the law. Well, what's the greatest? What's going to be that golden Willy Wonka ticket to get me straight to heaven? And so here comes one testing Jesus. Wanting to see what Jesus has to say. Don't you love his answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Sometimes we look at this passage and and we want to focus on that word love and and, and we have to pay attention to the word love. We're, We're to seek the best in God's interest to bring Him glory. Sometimes we look at this passage and, and we focus on the on the heart or the mind or the soul or, or our abilities and strength. But there's a little three letter word. That's repeated time and time again. All. All. Jesus uses the word all four times in reference to four things. Our heart, soul, mind, strength. We are to seek the best interest of God with our all. All of my emotional self, all of my logical self, all of my deep internal thoughts, all of my abilities are to be totally devoted to seeking the best interest of God. God demands to be at the center of my life. There is no room for self at the center of our heart. And that's the secret to having a heart pure from self-righteousness. Because the reality of it is, God will be at the center of our lives or He is not there at all as far as He's concerned. Only when I dethrone self from the throne of my heart and replace self with God, it is only then I can have a pure heart and be able to mimic the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Thank you.